it's pretty well known that there's nothing that really works without having some negative side effects. Logan Christopher from LegendarySTrength.com. You're telling me that these herbs enable you to get a lot of benefits without having any side effect at all? The co-founder and CEO of Lost Empire Herbs, a herbal and natural supplement company. The detail that Logan goes into with his training in his Think and Grow Strong course is way beyond anything that I've done. How does it work and is it really true? If you're looking to have better sleep, there's herbs for that. If you're looking to have a better workout, there's herbs for that. To recover better from the workout, there's herbs for that. You're not going to get stronger. You're not going to get faster if you don't have testosterone flowing in your body. It's true for both men and women. What are the best supplements that help with with weight loss. Weight loss, it is predominantly going to be a function of diet. If you're looking for a miracle herb that's going to help you to shed 50 pounds, it, it doesn't exist. The next big one for me is low attention. How can herbs help those who suffer from low attention, which is pretty much everyone right now? If we are constantly on TikTok where it's 15 second videos, we're training our focus to only be able to last that long before it's on to the next thing. So what can you do to be able to detach and focus is... Is there such thing as an, a happiness herb? There are some herbs that can help with happiness, helping to support anxiety and depression. One of the, the great herbs for that purpose is known as the tree of happiness. If there was a key takeaway for today, what would it be? Try some herbs. Welcome to the podcast, Logan. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. You are the man behind my absolute favorite herbs company, Lost Empire Herbs. These herbs coupled with water fast and other biohacking techniques helped me overcome the hardest moments in my life when I was suffering from the post finasteride syndrome. So I wanted to thank you for this. Ah, you are very welcome. And not only did your herbs um, help me overcome these atrocious moments, but they also helped me build an absolute edge in life. Taking these herbs is like a cheat code on how to feel more energized, calmer, happier, smarter, and generally more amazing most of the time. So let's dive into this fascinating world of herbs, nootropics, and other techniques to become a stronger, smarter, calmer, and better version of yourself. Sounds With good to me. Logan Christopher, the co-founder and CEO of Lost Empire Herbs. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great. I'm taking Very... some herbs, so, you know, I'm feeling, feeling good. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely know that. So, so let's start with... Uh, a few videos of yourself I've seen on the web. There's one where you are pulling a small truck with your hair, so with your ponytail, basically. There's another one where, uh, on which you're um, d doing deadlifts with 500 pounds, I think. But you don't, you don't look like a bodybuilder at all. How the hell is that possible? <laughs> oh, let me specify, it was a small fire truck, so not quite the big fire engines of today, but it was a large truck, 8,800 pounds, which would be what about, uh, is that 4,000 kilograms? So fairly sizable. Okay. Um, I decided to get into fitness and strength despite being like really weak and scrawny and unathletic growing up. And just for some reason, this is like one area where I, I started to have some results and to build some confidence, but I'm not naturally a big guy at all. And I decided I didn't really want to even be a big guy. So what I focused on in building my strength is what I call deceptive strength or more of a wiry strength and a lot more focus on tendon and ligaments and even the bone structure than the muscles, as well as the, the mental component. And focusing on strength in this way is what actually led me to herbs in the first place. Why would you be more interested by this aspect than the actual physical aspect that most people can see and that most people are um, seeking in the gyms? Yeah, so I guess I've always kind of tended toward looking at things more holistically or systems wide. So, I mean, there is a huge physical component to it, just not necessarily focused on the muscle size. Perhaps it was that, you know, I'm, I'm not natural. It's not easy for me to build muscle. I'm the classic hard gainer type. So with that, I decided to go in more directions where my strength might lie. And I've always been a smart guy. So really discovering how to take my mind and really apply that 
because everyone knows in sports, you can look at a wide range of uh, quotes from uh, famous athletes saying, you know, 90% of the game is mental, things like this. And this is true in the strength training world just as well, even though, of course, you're doing physical things, lifting heavy weights, the mind and how you think about things, how you visualize your beliefs, all of this plays a huge, massive role in the results you're going to get. Yeah, absolutely. I was I was uh, just doing some um, some push-ups today and some uh, uh, chest exercises, and I was just uh, I was actually I think ninety kilos, and um, so lifting ninety kilos, and I was just thinking, oh, I'll do five reps, you know. And if you decide to do five reps, you probably be able to do five reps, but it's going to be absolutely impossible to do six. Whereas <laughs> if you decided to do seven and you have that that goal in your mind you'll probably be able to do seven. Why is that? Yeah. Uh, again, it's beliefs, it's expectations, decisions. So what you're doing when you're deciding to do a certain rep count is you are, in essence, like rallying your nervous system energy to be able to focus on that. Uh, that doesn't mean you're always successful in doing so. One of the things I like to do oftentimes with exercises is if I actually like want to hit six reps, then I'll visualize myself doing eight. Just going over above in that way mm. helps to get to that level. That's something that I often do. Have a whole bunch of visualization techniques that can really help to, uh, as I said, kind of rally the nervous system energy to be able to do what you want to do. Great. So, so, so let's start with a bit of your story. What, what are the few key turning points in your life that led you to being here today on this podcast as the founder and uh, CEO of a herbal and natural supplement company? Yeah, good question. Well, I, I would say getting into fitness in that first place. And really, I, I was trying the kind of commercial bodybuilding thing for a while. I guess that goes and answers more of your question. I didn't have success doing that at all. I, I mentioned the hard gainer thing, but I was not seeing much in the way of results. Uh, but then I found about body weight exercises and specifically like there's a lot more than just like push-ups and sit-ups that you can do. So working towards handstand push-ups, that really set me on uh, this pathway. And then when I was focused on the, the strength training, um, I was looking for a secret weapon. So this led me into neuro-linguistic programming for the, the mental training. This led me into energy medicine. This also led me into herbalism. Uh, the first time that I took the cordyceps fungus, uh, this is a famous mushroom that's been used by Olympic athletes, really good for increasing like oxygen uptake and energy. And the first time I took this, I felt a difference in my workouts, working with kettlebells at the time. So I was hooked from the beginning. And from there, it was just a matter of exploring one herb after another and finding that you could get an edge and different benefits in different places. Fast forward a couple of years because that was my secret weapon. I wasn't really talking about it. I was just doing it for myself. Then my brother comes to me and says, you know, uh, he was getting into herbs at that time and wanted to start a company. So he's like, hey, if I find the source of this herbs, can you put up a website? Can we start selling these things? So we started real small. It was on a kitchen table type of thing where we were really just focused on like, hey, if we get herbs and sell some to other people, so we can fund our own supply. <laughs> so that was our whole mission in the beginning, but the company has obviously grown quite nicely since that time. So it's a much bigger endeavor than we really even imagined in the beginning, but we're still having a lot of fun with it. So last time we talked, you told me that whatever you want in the world, there's a nerd for that. Can you elaborate? Yeah. 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 Our saying is there's an herb for that. So if you're looking to have better sleep, there's herbs for that. If you're looking to have a better workout, there's herbs for that. To recover better from the workout, there's herbs for that. So you mentioned uh, having some side effects from medication. There's maybe herbs that can support uh, different things that occur with that. So really, whatever you're looking for, there are herbs across the world that can help support not just health, but performance. So we really look at this idea of performance, of course, that comes from, you know, being in the gym and lifting weights, right? There's that obvious athletic performance, but there's uh, sexual performance, there's sleep performance. We can look at it in this way. So that whole idea of like biohacking, how can I get the edge? How can I be better at life? We can apply this to the herbal world, which is not necessarily the traditional way of looking at it, but definitely applies to this day and age. Link to what you're saying about it's not the traditional way to look at things. Why 
in 2023, where people, I think, are more, we have more and more information available online. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. The new generation also is much more curious, much more educated. Why is it still seen as weird when I, for example, tell people, oh man, I'm taking 21 different herbs that I rotate every day to not develop tolerance, these testosterone boosting herbs. As soon as I talk about I'm taking herbs, people are like, oh, do you smoke weed? Ha ha ha. Like, <laughs> why? Why? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of people tend to think that I'm in the weed business when I say the name of my company, but we, we don't even <laughs> do anything with CBD. Um, it, it, it's the lack of knowledge of herbs just culture-wide is the main reason. Uh, in large part, this is uh, due to modern medicine and pharmaceuticals, right? We're taught that you go to the doctor and you do what the doctor says, you you pop the pills that the doctor takes for whatever health condition you happen to have. And there's this abdication of responsibility that, well, underlies a lot of the problems going on right now. So it's just this total lack of knowledge about herbs. The average person out there doesn't know what an herb is besides some culinary herbs, you know, like oregano or basil, which can have some amazing benefits, right? But we really use these to just flavor things. We don't actually look at what they're doing for our health in general. So that's your average person's perception of herbs. So they, they think it's this kooky thing that the whole mainstream likes to talk about. This doesn't work. This isn't going to do anything, right? So we have to go kind of alternative and unconventional to really even begin to understand and have a paradigm in which herbs make sense to us. Uh, there's a saying in nature of plant blindness, right? The average person goes walking through a forest. They may have a good time on a hike, but they don't know a single plant or tree, right? In general, right? We have this complete plant blindness that blinds us to nature. Us humans have really removed ourselves from nature in many ways. And of course, you know, there's some benefits to like overcoming nature and reasons why we have done that. But in going so far, we are now missing the benefits of nature. We have lost that relationship to nature, which includes herbs. And in doing this, we are suffering in many ways because human beings are natural creatures, right? We're supposed to live in this symbiotic relationship with the earth. And by removing ourselves, by doing our best to do that, we suffer the consequences. What's really interesting is that this is, not, this is nothing new, actually, because we're, we're all so used to go, okay, I have a, I have a problem. I'm going to treat the symptom with some pharmaceutical medicine or drugs instead of looking at the underlying uh, roots or cause. And that's the kind of way that we're all educated. And it could, mm -hmm. it could, we could feel like this is, it's always been that way, but actually there, there is some other parts of the world or other people who think differently and have been doing that for thousands of years and that thousands of years. And that's where these herbs come from. So you started to take herbs to become stronger in the gym. So let's focus maybe just on that in the beginning. How can herbs found in the middle of the Amazon forest or in some of the most remote Chinese and Indian provinces help in bodybuilding? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the first benefit is, I'd say, more energy, right? You know, it, it takes energy to put to output that energy in the gym. So if you're feeling more energy in the moment, then you're generally gonna be much better. Uh, we do say, see with bodybuilding or other athletic functions that, that there are a bunch of pre-workout supplements out there. Many of these are filled with like isolated vitamins. There's often like artificial flavors, they're neon blue colors and all kinds of things. So. Uh, Although some of these may work in that uh, you'll have more energy, for instance, caffeine is often used, uh, beta alanine, uh, different supplements like this. Uh, in my opinion, they, they may be working for that function, but at, at what sort of cost? Is it really supporting your health overall? So looking at that out there, um, and I had experimented with those uh, kind of early in my career, I started working with her as like, oh, can I really just like put together a pre-workout? formula just using herbal ingredients. Uh, one of the herbs that we work with is ant extract. It's literally, uh, it's, it uses ants. It uses the insect. Um, if we look at this from a Chinese medicine perspective, where it has been used for thousands of years, you know, ants are these strong creatures, uh, the strongest creature uh, pound for pound on the earth. So can it it's not going to make it that strong, but can it lend some of that ability? And one of the functions of ant or the benefits is that it tends to give people usable, more feelable energy right in the moment. So this one alone was a great uh, pre-workout 
uh, supplement, then can we add some other things in addition to that? Uh, some of the adaptogens, these would be like rhodiola, cordyceps that I mentioned earlier, schizandra, ulothero, which is also known as Siberian ginseng. These are studied in uh, Russian science to show that they help with not only physical, but mental fatigue and stress, and they allow your body to adapt to stress. That's where the word adaptogen comes back or comes from in the first place. So whatever stressors you have, which working out in the gym, uh, athletics is a form of stressor, your body's going to better be able to adapt to that. So these are just some of the ways that herbs can help in there. And uh, we're also talking about hormone function, right? You're not going to get stronger. You're not going to get faster if you don't have testosterone flowing in your body. True for both men and women. And of course, there are other hormones at play. So if your testosterone is not in that optimal range, then herbs can be used to help support it to get there as well. So these are a few of the ways that these can be helpful. Uh, one of the interesting things that you, that you mentioned is when you're talking about pre-workouts or vitamins or even um, drugs or pharmaceutical medicine, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's pretty well known that there's nothing that really works There is nothing that would really work without having some negative side effects. Otherwise, it would not really work in the, in the, in the first place. It would be kind of neutral, right? Yeah. So it seems that you're, t you're telling me that these herbs enable you to get a lot of benefits without having any side effect at all or without having too much side effect or while at the same time supporting other parts of your hormonal system? Like, how, how, how does it work? And is it really true? Are there not risks to taking these herbs? Uh, there are risks to everything. Like you can kill yourself by drinking too much water, right? So we want to keep that in mind. The way that I really look at this is kind of a, a spectrum. On one side, we have food. On the other side, we have drugs. So what, what are drugs? Oftentimes, it, we're taking a single component from something in nature or, and tweaking that chemically. Uh, often that's done for patenting reasons, but then we're doing like a huge amount of this in order to drive a specific biochemical reaction within the human body. And this can be beneficial at times. I'm not denying that drugs uh, don't have their place, although they're overused. Uh, by, but by driving this one specific pathway, oftentimes, you know, because the body is working on feedback loops, that's going to have some of the side effects coming from there. So if we're working on this end of the spectrum, yes, there can be some benefits, but oftentimes there are larger side effects that come from that. On the other hand, we have food, food that we need for just our general day-to-day -day activities, right? And there's not really medicinal components to a lot of our food. But if we look in the between here, we can see things like superfoods, or we can see things like herbs, or sometimes those isolated nutrients, right? If we're taking just vitamin C, ascorbic acid, that can have tremendous benefits in the, the body without a lot of Uh, side effects. Though, again, dosage matters. Too much vitamin C, you often get some gastrointestinal uh, distress, may have diarrhea from that. Um, so with herbs, it, it's and it depends on the herb because, of course, some herbs are dangerous. There are mushrooms out there that will kill you if you eat it. You don't want to take that, right? Uh, but other herbs, uh, a lot of them are going to be a lot safer. So here, if we're playing more in the mid middle ground, And it's working more holistically. We're not just isolating a single component from an herb. Some people do that. And again, this, this is just moving it closer to a drug in its performance by doing so because you're isolating one thing, which is going to have more of that driving that specific biochemical pathway. But using an herb that has, you know, it's 50 different constituents with vitamins and minerals, it's going to work in the body in a more holistic fashion, uh, generally more balancing in its effects. So we may get some of that performance boost with having less side effects. Again, this these are just general rules of thumb. Uh, this doesn't mean that uh, no herb has any side effects. That de definitely occurs. Uh, one of the things we have to look is individual person, right? So one person takes this herb, it's going to work great for them. Another person takes this herb, they get no benefit from it. There's different factors we need to look at there. And for some people, you may even find that there's some issues there. So for instance, pine pollen, which is one of our best-selling uh, testosterone-boosting herbs, 
works great for a lot of people. Some people have allergies to it. Absolutely. If you have an allergy to it, you're going to have some side effects. It's not going to be the right herb. Try something else like Tonkat Ali and see if you can some, get some benefits from it without side effects. So, so before we dive into a bunch of, I mean, before we dive into the wonderful world of herbalism and like it takes some very concrete examples of where herbs can be applied. What lifestyle, because obviously, you know what, if you start to tell people, people, they just want to pop a pill and think that everything will happen magically. It could be with medicine or it could be with herbs. It could say, oh, amazing. I can't sleep at night. I could just, so I'm, I should just be able to take these, you know, mushrooms or whatever, nootropics to sleep better and I should sleep better. And if I, it doesn't work one, it means, oh, it's just crap. What, what lifestyle and diet can increase the efficacy of these herbs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And yeah, you're absolutely right. We, we can take this same model of just trying to take an herb in order to fix a symptom, right? It's, it's not just drugs that we do this with very much can be the case with supplements. So I'm uh, all about changing lifestyle. I really see like herbs and supplements. This is something that can enhance, but if you're not addressing the root issues, if you're not going into those lifestyle things, you're really not going to get as far as you want to go. You know, I, I love when we get those, like I took your herbs and it changed my life story. Like I I'm all for that. And I really see herbs as like the tip of the spear. Can we use these? Can we get people like quick, uh, great results and get them back to a more natural lifestyle where they're supporting their health in all these different ways. So yeah, we really want to address things like just the basic foundations of health, your sleep. And yes, there's some herbs that can help with this. And there's a whole lot of non-herbal things that need to be done in order to have good quality sleep, uh, water and hydration. You know, what's the quality of the water since we're 70 plus percent of uh, water in our body, what are we getting with that? Then just diet, like natural foods, low on toxicity, uh, high on supporting nutrients that are going to help with our health. So in general, the, the more you can focus on these basics, you know, breathing, are we breathing? You know, this is something we need to do every single moment. So there's certain breathing exercises, practices we can work with all these foundational things. The more you do this, it's also going to help you to have a better system overall. That's likely going to be a bit more sensitive and then you can like modulate what you want in the moment with the use of herbs as well you can use herbs as just like those foundational things you need but also like moment to moment i want to shift my mood a little bit like i want to be a little yeah. bit sharper because i'm about to do an interview on a podcast so i'm going to take some herbs for that right uh what, you can do you things have, like this what did you have just uh, this the morning podcast? i had uh, it's mushroom brain, which is a new formula my company just released that is focused around lion's mane mushroom, but has a few others, uh, reishi, cordyceps, and oyster. And that is uh, a good nootropic blend that helps to just bring on the focus. Awesome. Yeah. You mentioned neuro-linguistic programming before. Mm -hmm. What is that? Neuro-linguistic programming is a sort of a, a science of psychology that was used at really looking deeply into how our minds work. Uh, it was founded by two guys, John Grinder and Richard Bandler, many other people involved. But if we look at the words neuro, talking about our neurology, linguistic, the words that we use and programming, taking this idea of you know, our, our minds working much like software where we can program it to work in certain ways, that there are strategies for how we're going to do something. So with this, you can look at not just the words, but uh, how you're visualizing something, um, maybe how you're talking to yourself, including other people's voices playing a role in that. And we can look at these fine details and see that we are running programs all the time that are either going to help us get to where we want to go or going to hinder us in doing the same. So th th it's a wide field with a whole bunch of different aspects to it, but I found it's really a, a useful tool a useful bunch of tools in order to, again, help performance. How is it different from sophology? Where you're basically visual or visualization, where you're visualizing yourself, I'd say, I, I, I used to do that when I was staying, uh, play, playing a lot of uh, tennis at a fa fairly high level. When I was a, mm -hmm. a teenager, I would just have, one of the things we had to do was to visualize ourselves winning and we're just more likely to actually win afterwards because you are self-reinforcing this, uh, this self-belief, 
and mm-hmm. and and seeing yourself uh, win. Yeah. So yeah, sports psychology. So nothing in NLP is really new except in how they looked at the structure of things. Uh, one of the terms that was used was the structure of excellence. So while visualizing has been used in for a wide range of things in sports psychology, uh, something unique that NLP did was not to focus so much on what you are visualizing, like visualizing yourself winning, but how you are visualizing. So looking at the qualities of how that movie plays out within your mind. For example, uh, when you are visualizing, and anyone listening can do this right now, visualize yourself doing something like a push-up or playing a game. Do you see yourself from within your own body in that first person's perspective, or are you outside, like you're watching yourself from a spectator's position? This would be first or third position. And depending on what you're going for, it can be more useful to be in one position versus the other. A quick hack that I've developed that really helps with exercise is when you are visualizing to just brighten the colors, brighten the room like someone is turning the lights up. What this seems to do is like amp up the neuro, the neurological energy that is in play. And just doing this alone, people will often be stronger, be better at what they're trying to do. So it's a it's a quick hack that allows this. But so NLP looks at these specific qualities of how the visualization is happening rather than just what we are trying to do in visualization. How does this complement herbalism and traditional medicine? Yeah, so the way I look at things, again, that holistic kind of outlook is, can I do stuff that is supporting the the, the physical body? Um, and so this would be where we're looking at those biochemical reactions uh, with the uh, supplementation, with whether it's with herbs or other things. Then can we run some uh, excellent running mental programs on top of that. So if we're looking to perform, whether it's in work or the gym or wherever in life, how can we stack things on like 10 different levels and get the results? Uh, you know, if, if each of these things is just bringing like a 1% increase in our performance, then by bringing them all together, we're going to be that much better. So I, I don't like to look at like, there's just one way to do things because there isn't. There's a thousand different ways to do things. So can we bring these different tools from different realms to uh, be able to help support things? Uh, specifically with health, but also performance, I, I like to look at five different lenses of things, the physical, the energetic, the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual even. And how can we bring tools and methodologies from each of these into what we're trying to do? And again, by doing this, we are, we're, we're throwing the kitchen sink at any sort of problem or uh, performance area that we want to do. And in doing so, I mean, each of those lenses, you can have 50 different things that you're trying. But with that, you're going to get a more massive shift than if, oh, I'm, I'm just doing this one thing to try to solve this problem that I have. You're, when you're thinking this way, if you have these kind of five lenses and then you have, let's say, you said there is 50 different things you could do for each of these categories, And maybe you say, okay, obviously 50 times five, 250 things to do every day is probably a bit too much, but I yes. ha- I'm going to try three for each, so 15, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just an example. You're, you're yeah. basically, when you do that, you're basically leaving almost no chance to the problem you're solving to get bigger or to, to I mean, you're basically setting yourself up for success. If if we take the 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 the, the example of the herbs and and my personal story, I was at some point using a bunch of nootropics, maybe five different, rotating every day, and 21 mm-hmm. different testosterone boosting herbs. And I was telling people, why they, they were telling me, what the hell are you taking 21 different herbs? That's crazy. 21 pills every day. I'm like, no, take one per day. They're all testosterone boosting, hormonal balancing, but they're all work in a different fashion, and therefore. Mm-hmm. I don't need to know exactly where the problem is because if I attack it by 21 different sides, I'm much more likely to win. Right. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I'll give another example uh, in injury, for instance, right? Most people would think that an injury is just a physical problem. 
And in many cases, that is definitely a useful lens to go at. And we can look at physical. Again, this is kind of a fractal thing, right? So we can look at structural components. Like, is there issues? You know, in some cases, like surgery is useful. In other cases, surgery is not. In fact, in many surgeries, like placebo beats it out, right? Uh, that's an interesting area of placebo research that most people don't know about. Uh, but we can look at like, you know, how are you moving? Then we can look at the the physical through the biochemical. And this can be taking things internally as well as a applying it topically, uh, we can do something such as massage or body work on it. So these are different ways of looking at the physical. But I've worked with many people uh, on the emotional component of injuries. Uh, one of the techniques I've employed is EFT or emotional freedom technique, also known as meridian tapping, energy psychology, goes by a bunch of different names. But this is a way of looking specifically at the, the emotions that may be tied up in how you got injured in the first place. I had a woman that had chronic shoulder pain for something like, I think it was seven years, maybe even longer than that, over a decade. And just doing a couple rounds of tapping, focusing on the emotions of the, the injury of the uh, initial event where this happened, the pain went away completely and did not return. Now, it doesn't always work this well, but the fact that it sometimes works like this is pretty interesting because if you think about it, all the cells in our body are being replaced in something like seven years. So if you have a chronic injury, what is actually keeping it there? There's some sort of block, and this could be in the neurology, but it could be an emotional block that is keeping that stuck in that place. And by actually working using that lens of the emotions specifically and working with a tool that helps to free up that energy, then sometimes amazing things happen with that. So again, I like to use all these lenses, you know, doing some physical things to support that can be great. Sometimes that's all you need, but working at these other levels, the mental, emotional, the energetic is going to also have some useful results in many cases. That's really interesting. And it makes so much sense. So as a recap, Let's just do a little small recap here because I think it's a really, really important way to look at uh, any kind of pain or problem that anyone could experience. Mm -hmm. If you experience any kind of physical, emotional, or mental pain, what are the five lenses through which you should look at them and apply some practical exercises to be more likely to find, I mean, to solve the problem because you attacked it the right way? Yeah. And let me be clear, this is not just for pain. Uh, that's a, a useful case, but it's any sort of problem or issue that you're working with. So let's say your sleep is not, not so good. Again, you could use this model. But looking at the physical, the energetic, the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual. And these are the five different ways of looking at things that I like to use. Let's take an example of uh, sleep, because there's so many people who suffer from insomnia. I think one person in three experienced some sort of symptoms of insomnia, which is massive. Mm -hmm. Someone has an insomnia, okay? Yeah. Someone is suffering from trouble sleeping, falling asleep or staying asleep, which are two different things. What would you tell them regarding these five lenses that they can try for each of these uh, uh, lenses to, to optimize the chances of... Uh, beating insomnia problems? Yes. So let, let's start with the, the physical level, um, your sleep environment, you know, uh, blackout curtains. Uh, do you have devices in your, your room that are emitting light? Are, are you practicing poor sleep hygiene in that you're watching TV right before going to bed, for instance? There's uh, different factors like this. Then, of course, uh, herbs would fit in here or other supplements, you know, melatonin, uh, valerian, uh, some of the ones that we sell, like ashwagandha, can really be helpful for sleep. So this, these are some ways of looking at that physical. Then, you know, when is the last time you're eating and what sort of food? Some people have some blood sugar issues uh, that uh, can disrupt sleep. And it, is the problem specifically, are you having trouble falling asleep with insomnia or are you waking up later and then not able to fall back asleep? So we want to look at these different things and doing something like an aura ring or other sleep tracking device to give us some data about specific specific things can be really useful. So in general, just because of our society and our culture, the, the physical realm is very big and we can look at a lot of stuff in here. Uh, emotional, right? Again, like if you're watching TV and you're watching dramas that uh, have, you know, 
high swings of emotion. This could be setting your nervous system up in a sort of way where you are getting a bit jacked up. And with this energetic component, we could look at, you know, the, the Vegas nerve tone, the parent sy sympathetic versus the sympathetic, uh, different qualities of this. There can be some energy drills that can actually like calm you down in a different way. Um, although I have these five different lenses, they, they overlap in a certain way, right? So certain energetic drills, like I was just talking about, are also going to probably calm down the emotions, right? So entering into a, a meditative state, even doing something like a one hour routine where you are really, you know, turning down the lights, uh, not watching TV, disconnecting from your phone, turning off your Wi-Fi, even uh, doing these things as you, you just get yourself into an emotional state that is more ready for bed is going to be useful. Then the mental side of things we can look at are specific, you know, are the thoughts racing. There can be some uh, specific practices for that, such as, you know, if your mind's racing, write things down because your mind likes to hold on and fixate on things by writing them down, then that's kind of captured. And sometimes that allows the mind to let go. Uh, again, a meditative practice is going to help with this. And we can look at strategies uh, in an NLP sort of sense of how do you fall to sleep? Like what specific sequence do you go through that helps you to get mentally into a, a, a sleeping, uh, being asleep? Then spiritual, you know, depending on your relationship to the divine, you know, we could look at something like prayer. I have a friend that has some horrible insomnia stuff, and she went through uh past life stuff <laughs> that she was exploring that may be related to the sleep. So uh, again, depends on your beliefs in this area, but these are just some of the ways we could look at that full stack for an issue such as sleep. Amazing. A quick one before the big herbalism part, hypnosis. Mm -hmm. You're also a big fan of hypnosis, hypnosis, which I also did quite a lot of, and I think it's super interesting. Does it really work? Yeah, I wouldn't be doing it if it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, NLP did like study hypnosis, one of the big uh, hypnotists of the air, Milton Erickson, and a lot that was developed uh, from that. NLP in some ways is working with like a more of a waking trance, but really plays a lot into hypnosis. So this, like the visualization, is another tool that I found really useful. This is something that, you know, you get that physical relaxation, but we're working specifically like we can look for those emotional blocks or those mental blocks, playing with beliefs. Hypnosis is a great tool to be working more with the subconscious or unconscious mind and not just the conscious. And since the unconscious is driving a lot of things, a lot of the results in our life, it's a great tool to work with. So I've used it in a wide variety of things, but again, going back to the strength training, hypnosis is a great tool. I've, I've hypnotized people on stage to become stronger. Uh, so it, it definitely, definitely works. And I have uh, like pre-recorded, uh, hypnosis is that help people focus on different things from being stronger to more flexible to greater endurance and have had some great results in clients doing these things. Well, you, you wrote a book called Mental Muscle where mm -hmm. you dive into mental training and herbs performance. What's your key message for people throughout this book? Yeah. So I didn't cover the herbs so much in mental muscle, but this was focused on using hypnosis and neuro-linguistic programming and how to apply that specifically to the gym, to strength training, to fitness, uh, because most people, you know, everyone has heard those same quotes, you know, you got to believe in yourself in order to succeed, right? But what most people are missing is actual like step-by-step -step procedures. Like how do you believe in yourself, <laughs> right? How do you uh, visualize in a specific way that is going to enhance performance? So mental muscle was taking everything I'd learned in these fields and really applying it specifically to that area. So if you want to get stronger, if you're using fitness for uh, fat loss or for muscle gain, how do you apply these techniques in specific concrete ways that allow people to get results? Let's move on to the big topic of the day, herbalism. Okay. What is herbalism? Okay, broad question. Uh, we really like to look at herbalism from sort of a Chinese medicine perspective in that herbs is not just green leafy plants. Herbs can be animals, it can be insects, it can be minerals, it can be definitely plants are a large part of it, but also fungi as well. So. 
It's a broad look at different things that can help support human health and performance. And herbalism is about, you know, looking at what, what can be taken, what herbs can support, which sort of things, and really, in the end, developing a relationship with these plants, uh, then you can get much better results. Again, looking more at the root causes rather than just the symptom uh, alleviation that many people are looking at. Some people claim that herbs and supplements are a hoax. How do you respond to these criticisms? I don't. <laughs> I mean, that's just, it's a just... stupid opinion. So <laughs> it's, it's wrong and proven wrong just by looking at the results people are getting, right? Um, yes, there can be a placebo effect with herbs and supplements, but, uh, and I, I've looked at the bl placebo effect a lot more than most people. Again, I was talking about placebo surgeries. When you look at the fact that a surgeon can do an incision on the knee, but do no actual surgery, and in many cases, this performed better than surgeries, right? And you have people literally going from being in a wheelchair to getting up and playing basketball after a placebo surgery, okay? <laughs> When you understand this, you understand a little bit about how powerful the mind can be. And so you can actually have a placebo effect by believing in the herbs, by believing in the supplements, you can have additional effect uh, on top of the actual effect of things that are happening. Now, everyone is different. So some people are not going to have great results, even with herbs, right? They may be looking at a specific issue where herbs are not sufficient to fix the root causes, right? In many cases, uh, herbs can help, but in other cases, herbs may not be the tool for the job. Again, why I look at a wide range of tools, but there is no doubt. I mean, people have used herbs for all of human history. Yeah. Only in the last hundred years or so have we gotten away from using herbs and look at the state of our health today. Chronic health conditions are on the rise. And yes, this has to do with endocrine disrupting chemicals and pollution throughout the world. Uh, in a variety of different ways. So there's there's all these factors, but we have, for the most part, lost the use of herbs, which have been used in every community, every place in the world, every indigenous people, every tribe had the herbs of their local area to help support their health. So if you want to call that a hoax, yeah, it's hopeless for you. <laughs> Don't use them. We'll we'll take them. <laughs> An interesting way to look at that is actually, you, you, you mentioned the placebo effect which is incredibly important and i was talking uh, the other day i was talking about um kinesiology and magnetism with uh, actually my flatmate and i i believe in all that stuff i love as soon as i can go i just go and mm -hmm. you literally after 15 minutes of kinesiology you feel much lighter you're like oh man i had this crazy back pain and he's like pressing super hard your feet and then the the, the back pain is maybe not gone fully because it's going to take some time but like you feel much better already Mm -hmm. And then he starts to say, yeah, but you know, this is all placebo and actually it's proven that placebo works. I think a, a, a fair question here to prove whether herbs are more placebo driven or, or there is actual result is, can people who do not believe in herbs, because before you said, you said, if you believe in the herb, it might give you even better results because of a placebo mm -hmm. effect, right? Yeah, and we have testimonials from customers that they're they're desperate, so they're willing to try things, but they had like no faith in the herbs in the first place, and had some amazing results from it. And there there are countless placebo controlled scientific studies, which are the gold standard, right? So you got sugar pills versus the the herbal intervention, and that shows that the herbs work in many things, and oftentimes it is backing up what the traditional use of that herbs, whatever ancient wisdom was there. We're finding that the herbs often more often than not, do specifically that, and they ble beat placebo. So the science is there. And if you think about the, just the logic of how the word is built, I mean, I believe that if there is a problem, there is a solution somewhere, because otherwise the problem would not even exist. Because it always yeah. tends towards this kind of neutrality concept that I talked about before, you know? Mm -hmm. And so therefore, if there is a problem out there, probably, there is a solution out there and the most logical place to find it is probably in the nature itself. And it's probably he'd been here for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And that, that could be like a spiritual outlook on life, but I, I find that's a, a useful belief to have. And again, it's, it's not always easy, right? The, 
the first thing you try may, may not be sufficient. People often say, like, I've tried everything. No, you haven't. Like, no one has tried everything. There are thousands of healing modalities. There are tens of thousands of herbs out there. No one has tried everything. I've heard some stories of people that have really, like, they have tried a lot and they've often got great results because uh, if, if that's what you're doing, you're going through the trial and error, trial and success, finding what works, uh, then you're, you're going to get results. It's about keep trying out there and not giving up. The, the only way that you really fail is to give up on something, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Let's take a few concrete examples where herbs can make a massive difference in people's life. Mm-hmm. We live in an anxiety epidemic. Is anxiety something that can be treated or supported in some sort of way with herbs? And if yes, which yeah. ones? Yeah, you use the word treated, so I'm just going to put the medical disclaimer in here. We, we, we cannot treat herbs. I'm not a medical doctor. I don't play one on TV. Uh, everything that I'm talking about here, I like to say, is my philosophical advice. This is my philosophy of health and how I look at things. Um, so herbs, according to the established authorities, cannot treat any sort of disease. What they can do is help support healthy functioning, right? So anxiety, this can be generalized anxiety disorder, where it's a specific thing from the DSM. Herbs can't help with that, but everyone has anxious feelings. Herbs can help with those anxious feelings, right? So if you catch my drift there, uh, some of the herbs that come to mind for that is, first of all, ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is one of the top herbs from Ayurvedic medicine, so coming from uh, India. It is a root that helps with a wide range of functions. It is an adaptogen. Uh, I mentioned those a little bit earlier in the call. But the, it's a little bit different than most of the adaptogens. So, for instance, rhodiola, schizandra, cordyceps, these are somewhat stimulating in their effect. And a lot of people love them for that reason. But ashwagandha is more calming in its effect. So while it is helping the body better adapt to stress, it has a gently calming function. Some people find that like actually taking it right before bed, it is an herb that is going to help them fall asleep. But in general, it's not a sedating herb, right? So you can take it in the morning and you're not going to be tired throughout your day. What ashwagandha seems to do is the things that stress people out, just don't stress them out as much. <laughs> and that is a wonderful effect. Uh, I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of people like oh, you know, I started taking ashwagandha and this thing that would have stressed me out and caused all sorts of problems, it was like, eh, no big deal, right? Um, yeah, countless stories like that. So ashwagandha is a great herb in this way that can help with uh, anxious feelings, but also be supportive to health. Uh, it can help with testosterone. It has a wide range of different functions, but this is one area and one herb that helps support with that. There's two others I tried that I absolutely love. One is called mm -hmm. albizia. It's more like mm -hmm. when I really feel like I'm getting very anxious. Like basically, I always tell people albizia is the exact opposite of caffeine because the mm -hmm. caffeine is going to put you into this fight or flight response where yeah. you're going to be very alert, but you're going to be kind of jittery and like pretty much anxious. Yeah. Albizia for me is creating the exact opposite. So I don't know if you want to elaborate a bit about albizia. And yes. then the other one is blue vervain, which I know is quite one of yes. the you actually love. Yes. Yeah. So Albizia, this is one coming from Chinese medicine. Uh, in the extract, we use both the bark as well as the flowers from this tree. And it, it is considered in Chinese medicine, one of the strong Shen herbs. Shen is synonymous with spirit and one of the three treasures. It has a very strong mood regulating effect, right? So a lot of people do take this one for sleep as well. Uh, it, it just puts you in like a calm, relaxed state and one of our stronger herbs for doing that. So that that is a fantastic one. Uh, then Blue Vervain. Yes, this is one of my specific favorites. I'm more of a tincture person and we have a powdered extract of Albizia, so I don't use that one as much. But I, I love Blue Vervain. It is known as a bitter nervine, so it has this extremely bitter taste to it. But that is actually part of its function. That bitter taste actually starts up that cool, draining nervous system function. So when I take blue vervain, as soon as the drops hit my tongue, like we want to talk about placebos or can you feel, uh, I love these herbs where you can feel the effects right away. When blue vervain hits my tongue, I feel my nervous system just let go of energy, just like let go of stress. 
and I feel it in my muscles. It's not a muscle relaxant, but it relaxes the nerves that interface with the muscles. So in this way, the muscles then relax themselves. Uh, so yeah, blue vervain, it has, you know, it has a reputation. Some people call it, this is a trademark term, so we shouldn't use it, but liquid Xanax. And of course, mm. it's not as strong as the pharmaceutical. <laughs> uh, none of the herbs are as strong as pharmaceuticals. But again, going back to that conversation of being more gentle and holistic in action, we can get uh, great results without necessarily having the same side effects. I mean, Xanax has withdrawal and dependency issues, and it's a controlled substance and all that. So definitely, if we can use something that is quite a bit more gentle, uh, then let's go for it. So blue vervain is one of my top herbs. It's actually known as like specific for type A personalities and entrepreneurs for people that are running in their mind too much and need to get into their body. Blue vervain is a great one because it will just drop you out of your head and into your body. The next big one is depression. Can depression be treated? I mean, I don't know what other words to use, so I'll use treated, but we both understand that it's not the right word, right? Yeah. Can depression be treated through the use of testosterone-boosting supplements and nootropics? Yeah, so again, depression can be like depressive disorder or we all just natural human condition. We get depressed from time to time, feelings that are lower or feeling like we're being pushed down. Uh, so this is an area where definitely you want to look at what is going around. Uh, going around in your life um, and what specific issues there. So in general with depression, I like to look at like, you know, why are you, why am I feeling depressed? Is it external circumstances and what can be done about those? In many cases, if herbs are helping here, it can be a bit of a Band-Aid approach. So we definitely don't want to just like focus on the symptom, uh, but then what can we do? with it? All the herbs we just talked about, those may be useful in these. Um, so with Albizia, for instance, it's, I said it was mood regulating, right? This doesn't mean that it just brings you down, but it can also help you to uplift into sort of a, a peaceful state, right? So this is something that may be useful in that regard. Um, some of the adaptogens that I talked about, rhodiola, ashwagandha, again, uh, because you know, the effects of stress on our life and in modern day humanity, we have chronic stress conditions, right? We're all stressed, whether this is from toxicity, EMFs, um, our boss, finances, whatever is going on, the world falling apart in front of our eyes. Uh, we have a lot of stressors going on. So being able to handle those stressors better, the adaptogens can certainly help with uh, depressive mood and thoughts in certain circumstances. Uh, so these will be a few of the areas, anything that is uh, a Shen herb. Um, so what comes to mind is Rishi, Rishi mushroom. This is one of the top herbs in Chinese medicine known as the mushroom of immortality. Really great for all the medicinal mushrooms are great for immune enhancing effects in general. But Rishi is well known for just helping to support the mood to kind of like stabilize, again, to have that peaceful effect. Uh, so this is another one that comes to mind. Awesome. Oh, and you mentioned uh, hormones. Yeah, so men especially, but this is, again, uh, women have testosterone too, and it has important functions for them. Testosterone is a neural hormone, so it is active within our brain and our neurology. Uh, having too low of testosterone can definitely lead to signs of depression. So if, uh, and this is something that can be relatively easily blood tested, so you can look at the levels there, but yeah. In general, you're going to feel much better if you have more testosterone flowing through your body. So testosterone is helpful for feeling successful, feeling confident, feeling energized. This is going to be a, an important area to look at as well. Um, so that's an important thing. Like, not just I have symptoms of depression, but why am I depressed? Is this external factors? Is it because of low testosterone? Is there some other uh, issues going on uh, within the body that we can look at? If we look more deeply at the issue, those five levels I looked at were not just how do you treat or uh, go after a thing, but what is the cause of the thing? Uh, so if we can look at these issues uh, in different ways, then uh, we can often get better results. And that can help with the targeting if, if the issue is on emotional level, then oftentimes an emotional uh, supportive methodology is going to support. Something that comes to my mind b b based on what you're saying is, and, and then we'll continue with a bunch of really important topics that can be supported with herbs, is today I feel bad, I'm going to the doctor 
the doctor gives me a pill to treat a symptom, right? I mean, most people do that. If I'm aware that there's herbs out there and that there's different ways to support and to look at underlying root cause of problems, what practitioner or who do I go talk to? Because mm -hmm. there's too uh, many things out there. Yeah. I don't know what to do, and but I, I I I listen to this podcast. I think it's really interesting, and I yes. can, I want to try something new. But like, I need to talk to someone who knows that stuff and can guide me, especially in this in this um, diagnosis of where my mm -hmm. problem potentially lies and what are the few things I should start doing in this mm -hmm. holistic world to to cure my yes. problem. Mm -hmm. So in general, I would say one, you, you can find people that are practicing herbalists and they can help to point you in the right direction. Uh, further, I would say a naturopath. So a naturopath is essentially a doctor, but one that uses much more natural things in general. They're going to have a lot of training around herbalism. Um, again, I, I want to address this that, you know, sometimes drugs have their place and you need that stronger intervention. It does come with greater risks. But if you are having a problem, as long as it's not acute, you know, we're our doctor's best. If you have your arm torn off, then you don't want to see an herbalist in that moment, right? You want to go to a hospital. You want to pump you full of drugs to be able to handle the pain, to address the thing, try to reattach the arm, whatever. Uh, that in those acute medical conditions, like war battle type trauma, that's where our, our doctoring and medicine really came from. That is specifically where doctors are great. Outside of that, with more chronic conditions, uh, doctors have less efficacy. So working with a naturopath or an herbalist there can be quite useful. So the way I look at problems is, can we get results with lower level interventions? Uh, lower level meaning that something like herbs natural, not it, it, it can have some effect, but not likely to have the side effects. And in certain circumstances, if things get worse, then you may need to go for those bigger approaches. But this is how I like to look at things overall. Let's continue with uh, another big one. Today, we are all using all these social media apps. At work, we're using all these different applications with these notifications, Slack, mm -hmm. WhatsApp, email. And so this is, and the content we also consume is very short term form. Mm -hmm. Therefore, our attention is really decreasing. It's very difficult to, I was talking to the, the co-founder, CEO of uh, a, a, a huge, I mean, 14 billion company, blockchain.com. You, you know them because mm -hmm. you're also active in crypto. We'll talk about that later, actually. And he was saying that one of his biggest problems is he's not able anymore to just sit down and read a book or long text, you know, or to listen to something or to watch a film without looking at your phone or doing different things. So the, uh, the, the next big one for me is low attention. Some people call this ADHD. You know, we kind of like this, mm -hmm. it's kind of like a trend. Ah, I have ADHD. Everybody has ADHD. And probably we're all developing so, so, a sort of like ADHD just because of the way all these apps are yeah, the built environment. And, yeah. and how exactly. So how can herbs help those who suffer from low attention, which is pretty much everyone right now? Yeah. Yeah, again, I'd say the focusing on the environment because the the problem is indeed caused by that where you have this like super normal stimuli, uh, this dopamine driven sort of behavior of like looking for likes and you, the thing that's going to hijack your limbic system. You know, people are on social media oftentimes just to get pissed off, right? <laughs> uh, the, depending on what's in their feed. So uh, these are, yeah, in, in many cases, like, fasting from these or putting structures in place so you're you're not constantly like this because the more you do it the more it's going to feed that cycle and again herbs may be able to help to some degree but uh they're going to be a band-aid if you just continue to approach your life like this right so what can you do to be able to detach and focus is a trainable skill Right. So if we are constantly on TikTok where it's 15 second videos, like we're training our focus to only be able to last that long before it's on to the next thing versus watching a movie or reading a book. So if you want to do these things, then work on practicing these things. And of course, 
again, like the sleep we talked about, you can support the right kind of environment, you know, turn off your phone, put it somewhere else. So you, you won't have that. You may still have that compulsion, but you're not going to be able to check it so easily and just sit down in nature or in a room with good lighting to read a book. Um, some of the herbs that can help one of my favorite for focus is Bacopa. Bacopa. Uh, if you look at yeah, nootropic formulas out there. So nootropics, there are drugs, modafinil, for instance, there are a lot of isolated nutrients. The B vitamins are going to be supportive for uh, neurology, for instance. And then there are herbal ingredients. I like to call Bacopa the number one herbal nootropic. This is something that is included in lots of nootropic formulas, but I, I like to work with just the herb itself. And it's it's typically not done in like an isolated nutrient way. They use the, the full plant because that seems to work better. When I take Bacopa, especially the extract that we have, which is a full spectrum extract that's CO2 extracted, it, it doesn't taste great. It tastes like a hamster cage smells, but it works. <laughs> uh, I feel immediate like mental focus come in. Uh, which is, it, it's a somewhat subtle effect. I'm not saying everyone is going to have this. And in fact, the scientific studies, the research out there shows that the best effects to like memory and focus and cognition come after taking it for like one to two months. But for me, I actually feel like an immediate focusing effect come on. And that that's a nice thing to have. So again, going back to this tangible benefit, I, I can feel that effect. So I know it's working. I could say it's placebo, but I don't care if it's placebo, it's working. Yeah. <laughs> right. So Bacopa is my number one for that. Uh, I mentioned mushroom brain. Uh, the, the main ingredient of that is lion's mane mushroom. Um, this one works. It, it, I don't have such an immediate effect from it. I feel that little bit with our, our formula, but with lion's mane, it's, it's, to me, it works a bit more in the background. Other people do feel it more um, immediately, but this is supporting uh, nerve growth factor and brain, uh, brain derived nootropic factor. It is helping the nervous system to like grow and be healthy. So it's being researched for looking at neurodegenerative diseases. There's plenty of research out there and a lot more coming down the pipeline, but this is really helping to support the, the nervous system in a bunch of different ways. So it can help with that, with that memory, that concentration, uh, taking these different Herbal ingredients can really help to support, have a healthy neurology, which I think is important. Again, that toxicity of our world, we are in, under constant bombardment from stuff. So we all need support in these things, especially if we want to live a long, healthy and thriving life. You, you mentioned modafinil, modafinil, and actually there was, there was quite some over usage of non-natural you know, drugs such as Adderall and Ritalin amongst teenagers to perform better at school. It yep. was a big topic. I think there was even uh, something on Netflix about that, a docu uh, documentary on Netflix. Could teenagers take herbal supplements instead? Yeah, uh, definitely. So many herbs are going to be safe for younger people. There are some where you, you'd want to uh, stay away from, but in most cases, like I give my daughter, we give her different herbs, right? And have given it since she was a baby. I, I give her tinctures, right? Easy, easy to take. Um, and helps with termood and everything else. So uh, definitely, like I was saying before, you know, there are some cases where Adderall, you know, I know people that have had great benefits from doing that. But again, that's a higher level intervention, maybe some side effects. Uh, can we get similar sort of functionality off of just using herbs in the first place? This is a place I would start at before going to drugs. Again, if you're in a non-acute, non-critical condition, then you have the time to play with these sort of things and see if you can get some benefit from them. Another big one is low libido. In the last, and low testosterone, we kind of started to talk about that before. In the last 50 yep. years, we've witnessed a total wreckage of testosterone levels amongst men due to different factors such as diet, lifestyle, pollution, and more. Let's say I'm a man in his 30s, 40s, 50s, tired, with low mood and low sex drive. Do I go for testosterone replacement therapy or herbs? And why? Yep. Same thing we've been addressing. That, that has its place, testosterone replacement therapy. There are some side effects, some issues that come with that and the cost and the fact that you got to get injections or pellets, um, that is going to help in many cases. Again, can we address the issue with herbs in the first place? Lower level intervention, likely going to cost less unless your insurance uh, covers that because insurance does not cover herbs. 
uh, then yeah, can we get the benefit there? Uh, I've mentioned a little bit about pine pollen. That is our, our best selling herb, and that's kind of what we started the company with. Pine pollen is unique in that it has testosterone, DHA, it actually has human hormones in it. They're not just human, um, it, but it also has phytoandrogens. A lot of people, if they've been in the health space for any amount of time, they've heard of phytoestrogens. This is estrogen mimicking chemicals that are found in nature, phyto meaning plant, found in things like soy and hops and flax. Um, some of these can definitely have benefits. Phytoestrogens doesn't necessarily mean bad, but in something like soy, which is overused and overprocessed, there can definitely be some problems there. Um, and I want to distinguish these from xeno uh, estrogens, which are endocrine disrupting chemicals that also have estrogenic effects. These are found in plasticides like bisphenol A, BPA, but also even if you have BPA free stuff, it may be having other bisphenols in it, BPG, BPF, uh, which may be just as bad. Then there's pesticides. A lot of these have estrogenic effects as well. Some of our are, are different. Some are anti-thyroid, some are anti-androgen. So uh, in general, we definitely want to look at these things because this is a large reason we have a population level decline of testosterone is a pervasiveness of these in there. Of course, yeah, training, uh, fitness and sleep and diet are going to be important, but can we reduce the load of these uh, chemicals that are having these effects? That's at one of the first places I like to start. Then can we support it with something such as pine pollen that's going to have these phytoandrogens that help to support and boost testosterone within the body? Uh, another great one, I also mentioned a little bit, Tongkat Ali. This is a root out of Malaysia, also from Indonesia. Um, that has some great effects on testosterone. It doesn't contain any testosterone itself, but it is has these components that help to ramp up our body's own production and generally keep it freely available. Uh, there's many other testosterone herbs, but these are number one and number two sellers at Lost Empire Herbs, and that there's a reason for that. They're they're working for a great many people. How about women in their early 30s who feel more tired and less horny than in their early 20s? What are the best hormonal balancing herbs that are more likely to make them horny again? <laughs> if that's what they want. <laughs> yes. Um, so women's hormones are significantly more complex than men's. Uh, men's in general, like because of all the factors I just addressed, like if we can increase testosterone in general, that's going to be useful to most men out there, especially if they are suffering some lack of drive, like a libido type issues for women. Uh, while many of them actually do have low testosterone, some of these same herbs absolutely can help. Um, we also have to look at the issue of like progesterone and estrogen much more. Men also have progesterone, estrogen, and those can be too low or too high in certain circumstances. So again, we all have the same hormones. It's just different levels. Uh, but women specifically, they have their monthly cycle and that complexifies things. It makes it uh, a bit harder uh, to say just in general, you need this thing. But um, again, if specifically libido is an issue, I would look at low testosterone being an issue and therefore some of these same herbs that can help. Uh, one of the things that we have at Lost Empire is a formula called Athena's Women's Formula. This has some of the pine pollen in it, but it also has Dong Kwai and Shadavari. These are the number one herbs from Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine for women in general. Just thousands of years of reputation supporting a wide range of uh, women's issues uh, from, yeah, like PMS type of issues, but also helping with menopause and easing through that transition, uh, a wide range of issues. And these can be really helpful in there. So we've had some amazing, amazing uh, results for women uh, with, um, with these formulas as well. Uh, I'll also mention blue vervain. I talked about that before. Really good for that instant stress relief and for pain, but can also be quite helpful for uh, women's reproductive issues as well in alleviating some symptoms there. So again, we want to look at all these different factors and what's really in play. But yeah, if libido is an issue, then I would say looking for some testosterone uh, support can be very useful. And there are women that are getting like testosterone replacement therapy. That's a, a growing thing as well. But again, that has its place. Can we do it with something more natural like herbs in the first place? How do I avoid building tolerance to these herbs? Because obviously mm -hmm. if I take these every day, I'm more likely to not feel as much of an effect at some point. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, tolerance can be a thing. In in some cases with some herbs, then the taking it every day consistently is the likely the the best way to take it. And again, this does depend on the person. It depends on the uh, effect that you're going for. If you look at most scientific studies, you know, if the person's taking it every day uh, and it's being done in that way in order to look at the benefits, oftentimes coming 30 days, 60 days, 90 days down the road. So there's definitely a time and place for consistency. Uh, what you've been talking about, your your way of cycling the herbs. So specifically with the hormones, I like to think of it as a game of musical chairs. The hormones, as well as pretty much everything else in the, the body is working through a variety of feedback loops. So if your testosterone is too low, then the hypothalamus is reading that signal, sending different hormones, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormones to the testes. And those are then saying, hey, increase the testosterone supply. But then, then this feedback, oh, the testosterone is increased. So we're going to decrease these chemicals. Uh, and that's an oversimplification of how things are working in the body. And you have a thousand different feedback loops going on, right? So if we are boosting something, and this this can be an issue with testosterone replacement therapy, oftentimes, okay, we're just adding a whole bunch of testosterone into the body. What's going to happen there? Oh, we have too much testosterone. This is actually going to be converted over to estrogen. So in many cases, what doctors will do, if you're on TRT, you're also going to be prescribed an aromatase inhibitor. That's the enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen. Uh, so yeah, if we just increase this one thing, what are the, the down cycle effects on that? Um, so again, going back to the herbs, by taking something, you'll have some sort of effect but if you're cycling that herb, and that could be switching every day, a uh, different herb like you're talking about, or something that we recommend with our pine pollen tincture or our Tonkat Ali is to do something like five days on, two days off, or take a bottle for a month, then lay off for a month. Uh, this way, the, the body may ramp up in its effects that this is bringing, but it doesn't come to overly rely on those effects by having some period of time off your body can go back into its normal cycle and then be more sensitive to the effects. Um, because it, it's not necessarily that taking something too long is going to uh, give you negative effects. Certainly there are some cases where that's, but your body's gonna build tolerance to it. If you're already always getting this signal from the outside, then the body's gonna adjust all of its feedback loops to that signal. By dropping that out, the body needs to increase its natural production and then it's doing that, then you bring it back in and it's still in that cycle, if that makes sense. So yeah. these are some of the ways there are no hard and fast rules. Again, comes down to the individual, work with something, try it out, see if it works for you, adapt from there. Awesome. Is there such thing as an, a happiness herb? Huh. Say I wake up in the morning, I'm going through a bad breakup or I lost a family member and I feel really sad and depressed, is there a happiness herb I can take to uplift my mood when the underlying issue for my sadness is not a long-term chemical imbalance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we mentioned Albizia. That is known as the tree of happiness. So this will be one of the, the great herbs for that purpose. Um, another one that comes to mind is the happy berry. And this is goji berry. Also often been called like the gateway herb of, um, of herbs because this one actually tastes great. It's just a berry. So it's very gentle and nourishing in its effects, but it actually is working across a wide range of systems in the, the human body and just helps to support mood in a, a very general way. Uh, people that take this just, yeah tend to report just a bit more of happiness going around. So yeah, there are some herbs that can help with happiness. Again, any of those ones that we talked about with like anxiety and depression, helping to support those things and just support mood in general is going to have some of this effect. I, I mentioned our Athena women's formula. So that has the herbs I talked about there, but it's also rounded out with four berries, Shizandra, Goji, Longin, and see buckthorn. Um, so these have all of their own effects are really like nourishing and helps us support mood as well. That's one of the reasons why that is a popular formula for us. I want to take care of my health. I want to build a lean body and muscle. What supplements should I take if I want to become stronger and support muscle growth? Mm. 
Hmm. Uh, the first one that comes to mind is Sustanch. And before I dive into that, let me say this. So me and my brothers, we started with a real like focus on athletics hmm. um, and the different functions there. What turns out like herbs that help with athletics help with sexual function. It's like the same herbs, the same underlying energies and reasons behind them. Testosterone, of course, being important for both of them. Uh, so Sustanch is known as Sustanch in your pants or the stock enlarger. Uh, it is well known for its functions on libido and sexual performance. But I also find it's like one of these great ones that seems to be helping in uh, muscle size and just feeling strength and power as well. Uh, there's some evidence it's it's really early, but that Sustanch functions as a selective androgen receptor modulator. So this, I won't go into all the details in this, and it's pretty complicated, but uh, basically those feedback cycles of hormones I was talking about with compounds in Sustanch, or there are drugs that do the same thing, you can be selectively targeting certain androgen uh, receptors and modulating the function of those versus other ones. So testosterone has earned a bad name in hair loss, and that's where it's uh, DHT or dihydrotestosterone. Um, although, yes, there is some implication there. We don't necessarily want to take it all away. That's going to cause some issues like finasteride that you <laughs> mentioned early on, right? Actually, this and was, exactly, this was yeah. exactly my next question. Okay. Most of the testosterone-related products out there, because they, uh, they're responsible for creating more DHT, Mm -hmm. Testosterone, more DHT, more hair loss, right? Even, crea even creatine is the same. It works the same way. It's a, it's a big component used in the gyms. It's, I mean, it's, some people say it's good, it's great. Some people say it's bad. Some people, some people say it's actually the best uh, supplement you could take. But if you understand how it works for certain guys who are more prone to hair loss because of DHT, creatine, creatine will cause some sort of hair loss indirectly, mm -hmm. right? Is there a herb that can replace creatine? Or do these herbs that help support muscle also support hair growth hmm. or support hair follicle? Or is it is there another way than is there a way to, to build, you know, lean muscle mass and at the same time promoting hair growth with herbs? Yeah. Great, quick question. So with the DHT, and it's not only implicated in hair loss, but also in prostate growth with uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia. Um, so both of these areas do have like an overabundance of uh, DHT receptors. So the, the main issue, the way I see it is it, it's not so much a function like how much DHT do you have in your body, if we're looking at it systemically, but how much is going to these areas. And so if you do increase DHT throughout your body, which comes with some benefits for like muscle mass, for sexual function, really important for these things, but then it may be attaching to these receptors. So I don't have the answers. You know, if I could cure uh, <laughs> male pattern baldness, then I would be much richer man than I am today. I, I don't have all the answers, just some additional questions and some things, some directions to point people in. So yeah, we want to look at, uh, yeah, can we have the benefits without getting the downside? So there are some herbs that are supposed to uh, limit the conversion of testosterone to DHT. Again, we want to be careful of doing this too much. I gotta go. Sorry, <laughs> my daughter just popped in. Yeah, we saw, I saw I'm her. still on the call right now. <laughs> <laughs> I saw her. I was wondering how, how long she would do to, to come. Uh, let's just start again this part because it's really interesting. Yeah. So you, we don't want to have the, the, we want to have the benefits without the negative side on the, on the, on the hair loss. Yeah. So we want to look at systemically uh, how much DHT is in the body. And you can do that with serum blood testing. Right. But then how much of it is going to specifically the hair follicles on the scalp or going to the prostate? And uh, just with the prostate, I will mention that estrogen and the estrogenic chemicals are even more implicated in that than DHT. Uh, those receptors seem to be picking up both those compounds. So we want to look at that. There are some herbs that 
can limit the conversion of testosterone to DHT. Uh, there's some research showing nettle root can do that. This is one of our best prostate herbs in general, just helping with like urination frequency, amazing benefits that people get. The, the pine pollen, although there's not any research to back it up, the reports from our customers show that it can be helpful in these functions as well. Uh, the Tonkat Ali, although I mentioned it can help to increase testosterone and keep it freely available. Um, it, there also may be some of this effect of keeping um, or limiting the DHT conversion as well. So again, there's no specific answers I have that will help with all these things, but some of these herbs you can play with and see, is it causing an increase in this? If not, then, you know, and that's what you're going for. Maybe not the right herb for you, but can you possibly get the, the muscle mass, the libido increases without necessarily having the negative side effects? I'll also mention Hoshu Wu. Uh, this is an herb, not, not super hormonal. It's working a lot more in the background, one of our top anti-aging herbs. Uh, but this has a reputation of turning people's hair color back to normal. Um, so if it's gone gray of actually restoring hair color, unfortunately, this only happens in like 5% of people or less, but some people do actually report this having that specific effect. And some people have reported that it helps their hair to come in uh, thicker and stronger as well. Um, so these will be some of the things that I look at if you're trying to address these issues. We were a bit more focused on men, I'd say, if we say I want to build, become stronger and support muscle growth. So let's think about women who want to lose weight. What are the best supplements that help with weight loss? Mm -hmm. um, and this would apply to men just as well. So with weight loss, it, it is predominantly going to be a function of diet. So there are no miracle cures. And I, I want to address that because if you're looking for a, a miracle herb that's going to help you to shed 50 pounds, it, it doesn't exist, okay? Uh, what herbs can do is to help with uh, your appetite and your energy metabolism to some degree. So they're going to be supportive of weight loss endeavors. So I really see if you are... Uh, you know, dieting or exercising, doing some things, these can be the thing that adds like 10% or just makes it a little bit easier, which can make a significant difference. Number one that comes to mind is gynostemma. Um, this is known as the longevity grass. Uh, it actually has some of the same compounds as ginseng in it, the ginsenicides. And these, uh, and it's great because ginseng is like the most well-known herb in the world and uh, the most expensive for that reason, uh, especially if you're getting good quality ginseng. But gynostemma has some of the same compounds as well as a host of different ones. It's really good for just like energy metabolism, even uh, blood sugar regulating as well. So just taking this and you drink it as a tea, although it can be available in some other forms as well, uh, just taking it throughout the day is just going to help with uh, your mood, your energy, your blood sugar, different factors like this, that's going to play a role. So I'd say that is my number one herb for that. Number two is shilajit. We haven't talked about this one. This is known as the destroyer of weakness and the conqueror of mountains. Uh, and I love those names. Like in Ayurveda, especially, they give the most legendary names and there's always like 10 different ones for the different herbs. Uh, shilajit does a whole bunch of different things. And it's actually like a mineral pitch that comes out of the Himalayan mountains. Specifically, if you're looking for weight loss, I, I see the shilajit powder as being a bit stronger rather than the resin. We have the two different forms available. And with the powder, we are seeing, again, uh, energy metabolism. A lot of people feel energy from this herb. That's kind of the conqueror of mountains. Like you can hike nonstop on this. Uh, there's also some blood sugar regulating effects in there. And again, that's going to be a very important component for weight loss. There's also some like cognitive benefits and trace minerals and all kinds of things in shilajit that makes it a, a truly amazing herb. So the thing is it does taste like dirt, so it's not the most palatable thing, but uh, sometimes the effects are worth it. So uh, I, I would say those are two herbs to look at for that function. We talked about uh, quite a lot of different herbs now. So I think a logical question to close this chapter is what are the dosage to take is there Good is there question. such thing as 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 a scientific dosage or does it depend on the person 
Um, so in some cases where there is science behind these herbs and of all the herbs I've addressed, some of them are going to have a lot more science. Some of them have next to zero science on them. Um, so if, if we get fur further, so science progresses in a very slow fashion, uh, uh, if we see that there are human trials, there is going to be a specific dose in there. But even with that, that, that matters because buying a shilajit from one place is not going to be the same as a shilajit as the other. The extract ratio, the quality, how it's done, all these factors are going to matter and that's going to play into dosage. So in some scientific studies, yes, there may be a specific dosage that is studied and you can start with that if that is the case. But here's the thing, you know, science is always looking for averages. Like, is there a statistical significant effect with this number of people versus the placebo control? And if there is, we say it quote unquote works. That does not mean it is going to work for you. You are an individual. Some of the people in that study, even though it worked, did not have the effects or they had side effects or they dropped out because of some issue, right? So just because it is scientifically proven, or scientifically shown to have some effect doesn't mean it works for you as an individual. For all of our herbs, we have a recommended starting dose, and sometimes that's a range on them. This is, it doesn't need to be as exact as a pharmaceutical. Uh, there's a saying from Paracelsus, the, the dosage makes something either a poison or a medicine. This is very much true. Again, too much water can kill you. So we, we don't want to go to a, a too excessive of a range. We also don't want to have too small of a range that nothing works. But again, and that's going to come to the person that's going to come to uh, what they're trying to get. So we recommend you play with dosage. You know, start with our range. Of course, start with that recommended range. Start on the lower end, but work up to the maximum end. Are you seeing the benefits? Do you want to see more benefits? In, in some cases, more is better right? Just take more, you'll get more of the benefit. But that's not always the case. Sometimes more is less. So you take too much and you actually get an opposite effect. Uh, so again, lot, lots of different things. And we have some articles and information on our website as far as playing with how to do it, find the right thing for you. But yeah, there is no hard and fast rules here. And it also definitely depends on the herbs. Some of them are much more concentrated. So you're going to take a tiny dose. Some are not concentrated. Sometimes just like the raw material of the herb and you can take a much bigger dose. So we have dosages from like 100 milligrams, like a tiny spoon to three tablespoons. It's all over the place. I'm drinking a bottle of tincture at a time, but generally you're going to do a dropper full or two and that's going to be your dose. Awesome. So we talked about all these different herbs and techniques and things that people can do to feel better, become smarter, become calmer, become the best version of themselves. And this, and you can apply this, you know, probably because you're an entrepreneur, I think you have two or three different companies. These things, if you don't have an underlying issue, applying these techniques and using these herbs is actually a, a, a big edge in life. And one of the area where this can also really help, I think, is if you're trading or if you're investing. And one of the subjects that we love both and we've been involved both for a while is crypto. So you're a crypto investor too. I think you, you told me you bought your first Bitcoin at 240 US dollar, which is probably a while back around 2014 or 15. Mm -hmm. how, how do you apply all your techniques and learnings that we talked about today to build an edge as a crypto investor? Yeah. Great and as an question. entrepreneur in general. Yeah. Yeah, so it's going to go back to some of the subjects we've talked about, but like establishing the the right environment for doing this and uh, being able to focus and concentrate for periods of time, whether this is like, you know, I, I don't do day trading, so I'm like not studying charts all, all day long, but I have certainly learned uh, a bunch uh, and being able to study the different tokens and investments and all, all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, very much the same as working on my business. So can I set myself up to be optimally productive? And what does that look like? Again, physical, mental, emotional, energetic, spiritual, like this full stack is going to apply to my productivity. 
in general and uh, eventually like my financial health and assets as well. So we can look at all these different things. Some of the herbs that are going to help with this, again, the, the focus and the concentration. Uh, it's not necessarily like, oh, I'm going to do a crypto trade, so I'm taking Bacopa right now. It's not, not like that, but am I just supporting my cognitive function overall from taking these different herbs? Uh, the stress relief is obviously going to play a role when the markets, I mean, crypto investing is a wild ride, right? So having the, that stress relief and the ability to handle stress with the adaptogens is going to be helpful. Same with entrepreneurship. So everything we've talked about applies, and it's just, again, looking at the lens of uh, performance in productivity and work and uh, finances as well. Probably, probably the key, the two key thing, uh, uh, the two key aspects here are how do I div uh, how do I increase my tolerance to stress, and mm -hmm. how do I make better decisions? And obviously, one is linked with the other because if I'm less stressed, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna make better decisions, and that's what it all yes. comes to in business in investing and in life in general. And that's where yeah. all these techniques we talked about today and all these tools and all these herbs are actually, if you understand this, we were talking about looking at the, the problem from different angles and sort of saying, how do I you know, attack the problems or how do I optimize my life by every different angle? And how do I mm -hmm. improve 1% here and 1% there? But And if at first, if I improve 1% every day, I'm going to compound this improvement over time and become much better. But what if now I'm improving 1% every day on multiple factors and angle, then this is all going to compound with one another plus in time, and I'm going to end up in a much different place than I would have otherwise. Yeah. T t tell me about your craziest experiences in terms of gains and loss in crypto, because you told me last time that you were kind of like doing a bit of DJ and thing, a bit of yield farming and all that stuff. Is there something yeah, I, crispy that deep. you have or spicy that you have to tell us? Um, yeah, I guess I'll I'll share one of the uh, a, a few big really wins bad that, happened. that became like uh, <laughs> big losses. Uh, one of my most successful uh, investments was Luna, Terra Luna. <laughs> and it was also one of my biggest losses. <laughs> it, it was really interesting with it. Like I'd, I'd ridden, you know, I was buying when it was like six to eight dollars. Uh, and even earlier in that when it, um, um, yeah, had, had that and then rode it up over to like over a hundred dollars, 120. And I, t I took some profits along the way. The thing was like, I was, I was so wrapped up in doing things. So I'd be putting it in this yield farms and I made things overly complicated for myself to where it was, um, Yeah, it was hard to be able to keep the big picture in my mind. Uh, I, I really had too much complexity in there. And my intuition was telling me, it was like, oh, I really shouldn't be holding Luna and UST, which was the algorithm peg stable coin that was related to Luna. Um, because if one falls, the other's going to falter yeah, as well. <laughs> However, unfortunately, like I was super busy at the time. Uh, I had some internet issues, so I, I didn't actually take action on that intuition, though it was knocking at my door. And then a short time later, uh, it all collapsed, right? And I had... I understood it enough, the algorithm thing. So like when it was falling, I, I got out. So I, I preserved most of my money and definitely actually had gains in that. However, um, yeah, it, it definitely was not a fun situation and watching the rest of the, the crypto market collapse. What happened with that is like, okay, I have things too complex. So I unwound most of my positions. Like I had a bunch of stuff in DeFi kingdoms, uh, farming jewel and whatnot, which was also very successful, but I un unwound a lot of stuff just so I could have a simpler portfolio because I, I needed that. I had too much going on in my life where I couldn't give it all the focus and attention that it deserved. It was really great for me to really understand and uh, develop skill set and like get my lay of the land in the, the, the crypto verse. But right now I have a much simpler portfolio and I'm enjoying that. I'm looking forward to the next bull market though. That's for sure. <laughs> I'm going to take every, all the lessons I learned and really apply it in a big way at that time. Just um, for people, I mean, people, most the audience knows, uh, Dokun was actually our fourth guest on the podcast. Oh, yeah. Fourth guest <laughs> we ever had was Dokun. And the, uh. the fifth guest was Remy Teto from Real Vision, co-founder of Real Vision who actually mm -hmm. on the podcast itself told us and told all the lunatics that he was, um, he had 95% of his portfolio in Luna. 
and everybody wow. went completely crazy. So that's a really interesting <laughs> question. I also got massively burned on Luna because uh, we kind of ended up in the echo chamber through the podcast and the yeah. contacts that we had. So that was a very interesting one. And I also had some yeah. of my business money in UST, mm, yeah. which hurt. <laughs> which yeah. hurt. I got, we, we had I some I got, lost... Yeah, Lost Empire Herbs has some of its assets in crypto. We had some in UST at the time, not UST a whole lot. Okay. But again, uh, I did, like, once it started collapsing, got out, so like 80 cents on the dollar and preserved most of the money there. Again, I think we still came out. It, with the In the business, it was a little bit of a haircut, but I knew once that was failing that it was failing. It was, it was time to go. So Lost Empire Herbs had and still has, I believe, some money in crypto. Mm -hmm. Why? Is it more play of, oh, I'm anticipating the next bull market and I want to increase our treasury? So it's more an opportunistic place or play or is it more an, a hedge because of what? So f well, when we talked last time, a couple of months mm -hmm. ago, the, the U.S. banking crisis was a big topic. And now no one talks about it anymore. Despite Even though the, banks are still failing. <laughs> banks are still failing and, and yeah. the Fed is still raising rates, which means more banks right. are going to fail, but no one talks yeah. about it anymore. So what's your crypto play personally and uh, in terms of businesses? Is it opportunistic or is it a hedge? Or actually you're thinking, actually, I can have both an opportunistic mm -hmm. play at the same time as having a hedge. Therefore, it's a no-brainer. Yeah. Yeah. So it is a bit of both. And I'll just say most, most of the assets, both personally and company wide that are in crypto are in Bitcoin at this point, just because we see Bitcoin dominance going up. And at some point, then it will be like move some of the money from Bitcoin to the other assets for the more speculative gains. But so right now it is, yeah, hedging as well as, you know, the time and place will come again. I don't think crypto is going anywhere. Um, we've gone through this cycle before. It's going to happen again. So, yeah, that's kind of philosophy that I have personally and taking that into the company. We're in a really good cash position. Uh, so, yeah, we have hedged with some physical assets with like precious metals as well as cryptos. And that's just the, the state of the world and how people are being unbanked as well as the bank failures going on, all that. Uh, so, yeah, Bitcoin is a, uh, a strong part of our portfolio right now. What's the next big thing that you're focusing on with Lost Empire Herbs? Mm. Right now we are... We're growing, so we're starting to roll out some new products. We're getting some systems in. We're playing with the AI stuff that is out there uh, for good or ill. <laughs> I definitely have some reservations about the the whole space and the direction of things, but um, uh, not going to put my head in the sand. So uh, we're playing around with some stuff in that department as well. For example, like how can AI uh, be useful I mean, obviously, in terms of system efficiency and all that stuff, fine, but like, yeah. especially in the herbs sector. Yeah. So one of the things uh, we're working on developing right now is just an AI chatbot for a website. Okay. Um, the average person landing on our website has not heard of any of these herbs, um, doesn't know where to go. And we, we have tons of information. Like we see our... Uh, responsibilities to educate people about the herb because again that whole paradigm like i don't know what an herb is how do i take this what's the dosage all those factors play in so we need to bring people into an herbal lifestyle so we have great customer service people that really help people with this we answer questions all day long but can we put together a chatbot that has been trained on our entire website that knows all the stuff there and so people can ask whatever questions they want and get pointed in the right direction um, so this is something that is in development, um, hoping to roll that out pretty soon and just for it to be a useful tool that can help point people in the right direction to get them started with whatever questions they may have. Great. What's something you believe in and you believe gets stronger by, by the day? Hmm. God. <laughs> Interesting. Yes, I, Interesting. I, I come from being atheistic long time ago, but life circumstances and experiences have uh, taken me out of that materialistic mindset and uh, put me, I, I still don't know what exactly that means to believe in God and what exactly I believe at all that, but I, I do feel that is getting stronger. I mentioned that that spiritual lens and we didn't really talk about that too much. I'm still 
kind of coming to understand what that means for myself. But uh, yeah, just belief in something beyond uh, is has become much stronger for me and continues to grow. Is there a specific moment in your life or where you went from a, a, a phase to believing in something or it's more kind of a process that you've been it's, through? Yeah, it's more of a, a, a long, slow process, just kind of like chipping away at this culturally enforced, materialistic, atheistic mindset that is very strong in the West. And it's been like hard to overcome. And there's like two steps forward, one step back. So yeah, there's while there's some stronger moments, um, important parts in it. There, um, yeah, it's it's still a process that I would say is unfolding. I would mess. I would laugh at myself for giving that answer just like a few years ago. Honestly, I love it. I love it. <laughs> what what difference is? What concrete actual difference has it made to your life mm -hmm. to believe in something mm -hmm. greater than? yourself um that's a great question there is i guess more faith in life and feeling of support I, i've gone through some truly horrendous stuff in the the past couple of years and in many ways this has helped to strengthen my faith um so there's a deeper and more full version of myself that is emerging out of all this And with that, that, that just feels, I mean, there's a whole bunch going on, but with that feels tied to, um, spiritual strength, I would say, yeah, I've, I've always been a strong man or since I started doing this and really focused like, oh, physical strength and can we apply mental strength? But the last few years, especially have been really rounding out this both emotional strength and spiritual strength component as well. Is it something that would, that you would tie to destiny? So for example, I, I'm, I'm saying that because. My mother, when I was younger, I broke everything, my, my, my knees, my meniscus, I had operations, multiple ones, because through, all through sport because I was just like too extreme. And every time something mm -hmm. bad would happen, my mother was just saying, it's kind of the easy way out, you know, of feeling bad was, this is destiny. Something greater or better will happen because this happened now. Mm -hmm. Is this part of you? Do you think that believing in god whatever that means is is a way to explain things especially the bad ones to help understand them and accept them yeah well it comes to mind is just synchronicity right most people have heard of this it was popularized by young uh that this idea of like life events synchronizing that are beyond probability Right. And the amount of these, you know, some can be if you're if you're searching for it, you can definitely like find it. But some of these are just like mind blowing. And also this idea of like golden threads where it's not necessarily synchronous events, but just seeing how one thing leads to the other. And I, I do believe in free will, like human beings, like choice is such a huge part of us. And I do think there's something about destiny as well. Um, this idea that, you know. Our, our souls plan some of the events, some of the big things in our life. Specifically, I believe we're on earth here to grow and develop and to uh, go through certain lessons. So, yeah, some of these may be pre-planned. And uh, I, I don't know, again, exactly what that means, but somehow I'm believing both in free will and destiny. And I think those are both important components to our, our life here on earth. Awesome. If there was a key takeaway for today, what, what would it be? Try some herbs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just honestly play with them. Uh, so one of the things we do is we have a 365 day money back guarantee. We honestly like want people to try things and get results. If you don't get results, you can get your money back. So it, something we talked about probably is like, oh, I could use that, right? So yeah. try some of the herbs we talked about, see if it works. And, Get it from us if you want. We do cool things as far as quality guarantee and make sure we have good stuff. And obviously, you love us here. Uh, but, you know, even if it's other herbs or something you get local or whatnot, try some herbs out. See what they can do in your life. I can say the stuff is absolutely amazing. I can say. That's the reason you're in this podcast, because I love it, right. really. Yep. And uh, I, I, I'm just like telling everyone all the time, you should try these herbs, you should try these herbs. This is amazing. Oh, you have this issue, you can try this and that. And I've actually converted quite a lot of people into trying. I actually wrote a, a, a mini ebook 
Like, oh, yeah. I actually wrote when I went through all my shit. I wrote like a hundred page ebook with all these different herbs and a lot of other things, fasting and nutri nutrition and fitness and all that stuff. And at some point during the last bull market in crypto, I was with a bunch of dudes in Dubai who made insanely well, but we're all depressed, very mm. depressed because this crypto stuff is like crazy addiction. And <laughs> this is very bad for your dopamine receptor and for your mental health, which was most yeah. people don't realize. Most people who are actually made it really well in crypto are actually pretty fucked up. And that's one of the side effects. So what I've done is I took this ebook I wrote a few years ago and I, I, I summarized it into about 10, 11 pages. And in there, there's a, a bunch about, a part about testosterone boosting herbs and a part about sleep and a part about nootropics. And then there's links to the actual herbs, which are all linking to Lost Empire mm -hmm. herbs because they're the best herbs out there. Yeah. Um, Thank you for that. So yeah, thank you so much for doing this, Logan. That was awesome. Where can the audience connect with you? Yeah, so the website is lostempireherbs.com. I'm, I'm not super active on social media, though you may find me there from time to time. If, if people want to reach out, uh, email is probably the, the best opportunities. My email is logan, L-O-G-A-N, at lostempireherbs.com. Amazing. Thank you so much for this. Thank you for having me. It was a great conversation. It was awesome.